Welcome to Heart to Heart with Anna, featuring your host, Anna Jaworski. Our program is a program designed to empower the CHD or congenital heart defect community. Our program may also help families who have children who are chronically ill by bringing information and encouragement to you in order to become an advocate for your community. Now, here is Anna Jaworski. Every now and then we hear of a celebrity giving birth to a baby with a heart defect. In the past, congenital heart defects were rarely talked about, but now more and more people are coming out and letting us know about their broken-hearted babies and how it has affected their lives. It was my great delight to interview the host of Special Report with Brett Baer on the Fox News Channel. Brett Baer is the chief political anchor on Fox, and he has worked as the network's chief White House correspondent and Pentagon correspondent. Brett Baer and his wife Amy have two sons. Their son Paul was born with a congenital heart defect and has had open-heart surgery. Mr. Bear decided to write about his experience in a book entitled Special Heart, A Journey of Faith, Hope, Courage, and Love. I really enjoyed my interview with Brett Bear. I really enjoyed reading his book as well. I hope you'll enjoy this interview, and I hope you'll go out to Amazon.com and buy his book. Please enjoy today's Encore presentation. Welcome to the 15th and final episode of the second season of Heart to Heart with Anna, a show for the congenital heart defect community. Our purpose is to empower members of our community with resources, support, and advocacy information. Brett Baer currently serves as Fox News Channel's chief political anchor and anchor of Special Report with Brett Baer, seen on weeknights from 6 to 7 p.m. Eastern Time. It's the top-rated cable news program in its time slot and consistently one of the top four shows in cable news. Based in Washington, D.C., he joined the network in 1998 as the first reporter in the Atlanta Bureau. A graduate of DePaul University, he has a bachelor's in political science and English. He is also the author of the New York Times bestseller, Special Heart, A Journey of Faith, Hope, Courage, and Love. Special Heart is a deeply touching personal story told through the eyes of journalist Brett Baer as he and his wife face the most daunting challenge in life, caring for their critically ill son, Paul. 100% of what the author receives from the sale of this book is donated to various nonprofit pediatric heart causes. You can read more about the book, see photos of the family, and order the book at www.specialheartfamily.com. Welcome to Heart to Heart with Anna, Brett. Hey, thanks for having me. I really enjoyed reading your book, but maybe not all of our listeners have had a chance to read it yet. So can you please briefly tell us what Paul's heart defects were and when they were diagnosed? Sure. Paul was born in 2007, and Amy had a normal pregnancy, my wife Amy, and everything was going fine. Amy gave birth at Sibley Hospital here in Washington, D.C., and Paul was given a clean bill of health. So we had kind of a 24-hour blissful period getting to meet our firstborn, and obviously I was on cloud nine, Amy was on cloud nine. Everything was going great, but a nurse noticed that he was turning pale, and she wanted to do some tests. They thought it was a bacterial infection. Took him back for some tests, and they called in a cardiologist. It just so happens that the cardiologist who answered the page was world-renowned, Dr. Gerard Martin from Children's National Medical Center in Washington. He did some tests, an echocardiogram and others, and he came into the hospital room and told us that Paul had five serious congenital heart defects, the main one being transposition of the great arteries, In other words, the heart was pumping the wrong way. But he had pulmonary stenosis, aortic stenosis, and VSD and ASD, holes in the heart, basically. And he had to have emergency surgery within the next few days or he would die. So that's how we found out. It's amazing how similar your story is to mine. Just like you, I had my son with a normal birth, and we had some concerns up front, but everything was just kind of put to the side. My son was also born with transposition of the great vessels and an ASD and a VSD. Unfortunately, he also had a hypoplastic left ventricle, so he's had a different set of surgeries than what Paul has had. But the thing that surprised me most was just like you said, we thought we had a normal baby, and this was my second child, not my first, and it just felt like such devastation. When my son was diagnosed, he was in congestive heart failure, and to be told that he might not make it through the surgeries. And I read in your book how you had to wait an extended period of time before he could have that first surgery and how scary that was for you. 
Yeah, the surgeon, Dr. Richard Jonas, who's really one of the best in the world when it comes to pediatric heart surgery, happened to be out of the country at the time giving speeches. And it was 10 days before he'd be back in the U.S. So we had to make the decision whether to stay at Children's National in D.C., our home, or go to Boston or Philadelphia, you know, the nearest top pediatric heart surgery spots in our region. We decided eventually to stay. And so on the 12th day of life, that's when he had that surgery. I have a feeling that the prostaglandin, obviously, was helpful to him. But also, I have a feeling that just like with my son, those ASDs and VSDs are what kept our children alive because the blood was able to mix. And even though they weren't as pink as they are now, they were able to get enough oxygen to their brain and to the other parts of their body that they didn't end up suffering any bad consequences because of that. No, that's true. It's just that's am- what they told us. It's just amazing to me, isn't it? Um, what a miracle that they can really have is. some things wrong that compensate for each other. (laughs) That's right. That's right. Yeah, it was. Uh, That said, I mean, Paul was deteriorating fast by the time we got to that 12th day. Oxygen levels had dropped significantly, and we were probably only about a day away from, from being in a really severe situation. Right. You're so lucky you had such an excellent surgeon working with him, but it wasn't just luck. You had also done your homework. I was really impressed with how you and Amy were so calm through this. I mean, obviously you were devastated at the beginning, but I loved the philosophy that you and Amy adopted early on when you recognized that you could just fall apart at this time, especially Amy being postpartum, but you decided instead to handle things in a much healthier way. Can you talk to our listeners about the pact that you and Amy made with each other? Sure. I mean, we we got to some dark places in those first days and those first hours, I should say, and I think it was day two, day three, maybe. We got overcome by the emotion, and as you mentioned, postpartum, Amy was at Children's National, and they were trying to get an A-line in Paul's arm, and, and all kinds of stuff was happening, and it was overwhelming, and she collapsed. She became the oldest patient at Children's National. <laughs> and kind of mm-hmm. running down the hallway, her on a gurney, and doctors and nurses with them, with us, get down to the emergency room. They eventually give her fluids, and she comes to. And we then had this pact that we said we needed to create this positive environment for Paul. We needed to be the parents that Paul needed us to be. And we came up with this thing that at the end of every day, sometimes teary high fives at the end of the day, but at the end of the day, we would say we are one day closer to getting Paul home. And that's what we did at the end of every day. And we tried to be positive and create the environment by which we thought he could fight as he was fighting. I just love that. And I love the high fives. I know it seems a little cheesy, but I tend to be that way too. (laughs) Yeah. And I think you need something. And that physical contact, you don't even think about it at that time, but that high five is a little bit of physical contact and reinforcement. We're in this together, and we're going to stay together through this. And unfortunately, not all heart families do. For some families, this just terribly breaks them apart. Yeah. You know, there's just no way that they can... Do it. I've heard that, and ours was exactly the opposite. We had support from family and friends, and for us, we relied on the power of prayer and our faith. Other people get there different ways, but to get to the place where you can imagine what it's like after it's all over. For me, as a golfer, I was imagining walking down the first fairway at a great golf course with Paul. And for Amy, she would imagine running around on the beach with Paul. After three open heart surgeries and seven angioplasties, I've walked down many a fairway with Paul and Amy's run on many a beach with Paul. That's just so special. I I think it does take the power of that visualization, but to our listeners who haven't read your book, they may not know, you had people all over the world praying for you. You had people all over the world pulling for you. And I love the Grandma Brigade. You had a lot of family support, and I think that does help to pull us through. This is more than any one or two people can go through. You really do need a lot of support to make this through and to stay positive like you did. We need to take a short commercial break, but don't leave yet. When we get back, Brett will talk to us about the goal for his book and what he knew about heart defects before his son Paul was diagnosed. More of that and more when we come back to Heart to Heart with Anna. 
Anna Jaworski has written several books to empower the congenital heart defect, or CHD, community. These books can be found at Amazon.com or at her website, www.babyheartspress.com. Her bestseller is The Heart of a Mother, an anthology of stories written by women for women in the CHD community. Anna's other books, My Brother Needs an Operation, The Heart of a Father, and Hypoplastic Left Heart Syndrome, a handbook for parents, will help you understand that you are not alone. Visit babyheartspress.com to find out more. Welcome back to Heart to Heart with Anna, a show for the congenital heart defect community. Today we are talking with Brett Baer about his book, Special Heart. Brett, were you surprised after you were told how common heart defects were? In fact, that heart defects are the number one birth defect that children are born with. Did you know that before Paul was born? No, no, I had no idea. I had no idea what Children's National Medical Center was in Washington, D.C. I mean, that's how much I was uh, disconnected from all of that, and I did not know about congenital heart defects. I mean, one out of 100 kids born with some congenital heart defect. It's really staggering, and if half of those... Mm -hmm. uh, have to have some kind of procedure in the first six months. That's just a lot of people in our country. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, really I think is. whenever I speak around the country, and I've done it in this book tour and other times, whenever I say that stat, it's like this eye-opening figure. Yeah, it is. It's astounding. I was a special education teacher. I taught children who were deaf and hard of hearing. We just kind of took for granted the heart was okay. <laughs> Mm -hmm. I don't remember ever really talking about students who had heart defects. And looking back now, I know I must have had some who did. So this was an eye-opener for me as well. I want to give you a moment to talk about what your goal is with your book. I loved reading it, and thank I also you. love your goal for the book. Yeah, thank you. So basically a number of things. It's based on a series of emails that I sent to family and friends throughout all of this. And that was the genesis of the book. Then I, I put those together and I kind of structured the book around it. And I said, this could help some family. If I read this, I think it would help me at the beginning, maybe avoid some of the things that we went through. And everybody has something. And this is how we got through our something. Every dollar of my proceeds are going to pediatric heart research and treatment around the country. A number of great, as you know, organizations dealing with congenital heart defects and, and research, as well as awareness. You know, that one out of 100, plus there are 35 states that mandate this test, this pulse oximeter test for babies that you can test the oxygen level with a simple test. But there are 15 states that don't. And early detection, I think, could help a lot of families. Absolutely. In fact, Paul and Alex, my son and your son, probably would have been picked up right away. Mm -hmm. If they had done that within the first minutes of life, they would have seen. My son's saturations were in the 80s. I'm not sure what Paul's were, but it would have been an alarmingly low enough for them to say, oh, my goodness, something is wrong. Yeah. Yeah, I live in a state that actually has passed that already. Texas has already passed it, and I agree with you 100%. In fact, I even went to my state capitol to promote awareness of this pulse oximetry testing and how critical it is. And thankfully, the American Board of Pediatrics is advocating this, as is the American Heart Association. So there are a lot of big wheels behind it, but I think it takes people like you, too, to draw attention to this and put pressure on the lawmakers so it does become not only national, I think it should be international. No. I agree. And it's, listen, I, had it not been for that nurse, Beth Kennedy, we could have gone home. And right. we were scheduled to go home. And, you know, yeah. then you start thinking of horrible things. I mean, Paul could have been a blue baby. Mm -hmm. We might have lost him at home. We wouldn't have known what to do. And then there's the people right. who never, never really get diagnosed. And, you know, mm -hmm. they drop dead on a tennis court years later, having not drank or smoked and been in pretty good shape but it was some congenital heart defect that wasn't caught at the beginning. Right. And just to be fair, this test is really to pick up children with critical congenital heart defects, and not all heart defects will be picked up with this. Oh, Unfortunately, sure. what you just said, where people fall dead on a basketball court or on a football field, a lot of those children have hypertrophy, cardio mm -hmm. hypertrophy, and that wouldn't be picked up with the pulse oximetry. But for that purpose, we need to have athletic screenings for our children that actually look at the 
heart function and measure the heart walls and make sure that our athletes are safe. That's another thing that we've been advocating for here in Texas. And, in fact, there's a nonprofit organization in Austin that that's their purpose is to get these athletic screenings done, and they offer it free of charge to athletes in Central Texas. So I think we need to have awareness on multiple levels. I think starting with pulse oximetry is great because, like you said, Paul wouldn't have survived. And my son, Alex, wasn't going to be surviving for much longer. He was in congestive heart failure, and it was just a matter of time without surgical intervention. So that does pick up most of, but not all of, the critical congenital heart defects. And I thank you for promoting this, spreading awareness, giving proceeds to organizations that are going to help our children and our future generation's children. But speaking of children, I know you have a second son. And I was curious with Daniel if you and Amy were concerned that he might have a heart defect as well. We were. We were really afraid, actually. It took us a while to to get to the decision to have a second child. And Mm -hmm. it was really a big relief that, you know, he was checked head to toe and he is fine. His heart is very healthy. This is not in our history, our family history. We don't know why it happened. And that's also Mm -hmm. part of the research is, um, you know, why why are those numbers going up, not down? I mean, is it something environmental? I think there are a lot of unanswered questions with congenital heart defects. I think so, too. So did you and Amy have genetic testing? or did, we did. you just Was she a high-risk? Oh, you did. And was she considered a high-risk pregnancy? No. Okay. Neither, um, neither came back with any warning flags. Oh, that's great. Yeah. So, well, I mean, we did that, but we still were afraid. And sure. like, Daniel was born, and it was uh, really beautiful to see Amy have kind of the normal, uh, you know, being with a, a baby at home. You know, waking up in the middle of the night and doing all the things you need to do and not sleeping, but have that at home instead of, as you know, in a hospital waiting for a surgery. Right. And she was able to nurse him and do all those things that she was denied being able to do with Paul. Mm -hmm. So I'm sure that meant a lot to her that she had that bonding experience. I was so proud of how strong she was with Paul that she was able to do the nursing vicariously, you know, by pumping and then feeding him either with the machines at first and then later with the bottle. That she was just determined that he was going to have her milk. And I know exactly how she felt. I did exactly the same thing. Yeah, well, I think it made a difference. And they told her it would make a difference with his mm -hmm. ability to fight off disease. And she made that her mission. And uh, it actually, Mm -hmm. talking to her, she said it helped her get through the kind of the grief of and the pain of not having that moment at home. Yeah, it's unbelievably difficult. We women have a a visceral response, and when you're pumping your milk, and you know your baby is supposed to be there eating it, you're not supposed to be pumping it and using a machine, but you still, or at least what I did, I closed my eyes. I envisioned what Alex looked like, what he smelled like. Sometimes I would even bring something that I had, you know, a blanket that I had wrapped around him just so I could have that smell, and I knew it was the one and only thing that only I could do for my son to help protect him. And I was able to nurse him well after his first surgery and even after his second surgery. And just like you said, I think it kept him healthier. My son never had to be hospitalized for anything aside from his heart defect surgeries Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and the catheterization. So I do feel that the breast milk made a big difference. Yeah. We need to take another commercial break, but don't leave yet. When we come back, we'll find out what Brett thinks we parents can do to raise awareness of congenital heart defects and what Brett found as the silver lining to his rain cloud. When we come back to Heart to Heart with Anna. Anna Jaworski has spoken around the world at congenital heart defect events, and she is available as a keynote or guest speaker for your event. Go to hearttoheartwithanna.com to learn more about booking Anna for your event. You can also find out more about the radio program. Keep up to date with CHD resources and information about advocacy groups, as well as read Anna's weekly blog. Anna wants you to stay well-connected and participate in the CHD community. Visit hearttoheartwithanna.com today. Welcome back to Heart to Heart with Anna, a show for the congenital heart defect community. Today we are talking with Brett Baer about his book, Special Heart. 
I know that you've taken great efforts to be an advocate for the CHD community, and I'm wondering what is your best advice for parents who have a child with a congenital heart defect regarding their own ability to become an advocate for the congenital heart defect community? Yeah, well, a couple of things. One is don't be afraid to speak out um, and, you know, put yourself out there uh, because you'd be surprised when you do uh, what comes back. Um, that's one of the things I learned about this through this whole process is uh, if you put it out there, uh, amazing things can happen. So uh, I don't think, you know, it's something that people are starting to be more aware about, uh, but, but communities could really learn a lot, and people who've been through it have a lot to share. So uh, tap into those hospitals that you've been working with and those doctors and nurses, and clearly they'll have some ideas about how to help. I also think offer your services and your advice to other families that you see who are just starting the journey that we've been on. You know, mm-hmm. Tell them, don't be afraid to take the help. Don't be afraid. Don't be too proud because you need it. Mm -hmm. You have to have other people around you. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's all perfect advice. That was something that impressed me with your book was all of the emails, not only that you sent out, but also that you received and the text messages you received. Do you think that that helped your family to hear Mm -hmm. from all of this? It was a big, big part of it. I mean, I don't think the book is overly religious, but clearly I talk about the power of prayer and some of these prayers and messages and texts that sh- uh, from all over the place that came in, mm-hmm. they really lifted us up and mm-hmm. they helped us through the toughest times. And it becomes this, again, if you put it out there, people, they think about you, they pray about you, they mm-hmm. uh, are pulling for you. And to read those in a hospital as you're dealing with a son who's you're watching the monitors and the oxygen levels mm-hmm. is a great thing. Yeah. I loved your ritual with Amy where you went into the chapel and you would go to the Bible and you would read something from that. Or people had marked certain mm-hmm. passages. And I thought that was really important. Well, I mean, I think it helps us when we do that to realize we're not the only ones here. <laughs> we're not the only ones suffering. Our child isn't the only one going through something like this. And I think, not that misery loves company so much, but yeah, in a way, it does help to know you're not alone. Because for me, that was one of the scariest things is I didn't know other families that this was happening to before it happened to me. And you do feel terribly alone. Yeah. And that's a big reason why I wrote the book, too, is to help families at the beginning, and hopefully knowing that we went through it can help them. The prayer part is just, it's what helped us, and sometimes you just have to let go, because I try in my career to out-hustle everybody and out-work them. I could not out-hustle this in the hospital. I couldn't out-work the problem for Paul, and eventually I and Amy, we had to collectively turn it over and say it's uh, Mm. beyond our means. Right. Well, I love how you and Amy did such a good job of educating yourself as much as you could and finding the right people, the right hospital for your son. It shows what a strong advocate you were from the very beginning. And this book, too, you're teaching Paul through your writing, through your speaking, through all the advocacy work that you're doing, that his story is happening for a reason and how he can be an inspiration to others. There's a silver lining here. I mean, you you don't want to wish it on anyone. But uh, a lot of good, I think, is going to come from what Paul's been through already. And I think there's a plan for him someplace, and it's it's going to be pretty great. (laughs) <laughs> I feel the same way with Alex, and in fact, it's funny because I kind of felt that God gave me Alex and a mission, and that mission for me was to also become a writer, and I don't have the fame that you do, so of course my book hasn't been nearly as popular as yours has, and it hasn't been able to make the impact that yours has, but when my husband and I decided that I would write this book, it was my book was called Hypoplastic Left Heart Syndrome, a handbook for parents, and I wrote it way back in the 1990s, there were no publishers that were willing to publish the book because they said the audience was too small. So my husband and I decided to self-publish the book, and we said, if we only help one family, it'll be worth all the work that we do. That's great. And the book has been sent to every continent except Antarctica, and I've received letters from all over the world from people saying that our story made a difference, and I'm sure you are going to receive 
a million times more mail than I no, have that's wonderful. with your story because you have the ability to get it out more. And I think that's just so wonderful that here we were able to take something that was devastating and to find the silver lining and to hold our children up as a vision of hope for others and to let people know that there are people who have made it. Because I think that's one of the scary things. In My son was born in 1994. And at that time, we were told that only one in four babies who survived the first surgery made it to age five. So it's funny how you were saying you were envisioning yourself on the golf course with your son, and Amy was envisioning herself running on the beach with your son. And my husband and I were in the waiting room planning a five-year-old birthday party. Wow. That's great. It was the same kind of thing where you you had to. Well, you have to envision that it's possible. And now just... This month, my son turned 20 years old. Oh, so great. I know that there are miracles that happen. I think both of us have witnessed miracles in our own lives. And not everybody will have a miracle, unfortunately, but at least we can try and educate people to give them the best chance possible and to learn to appreciate every single day because, and I'm sure you feel this way with Daniel too, it made me appreciate with Joseph, my other son who is heart healthy, we have no guarantees with any of our children. That's true. Yeah. So I mean, we, you don't. We have to appreciate every day. And you have to give him a hug. You never know and, what could happen. And you never know. <laughs> and that's one of the things about this book and doing the book tour. We would go around signing books, and Amy and I would go to bookstores, and we went to nine cities in six days. And mm-hmm. in those lines would be fathers with hospital bands on and their son or daughter had just been through a surgery, the children's hospital nearby, or mm-hmm. other families who just wanted to tell their story and it was great to listen to other people tell their stories about how they got through things and how they were lifted up so again just to your point if there was one of those families that would have made it worth it to do so hopefully there'll be more of them oh i'm sure you have touched so many people and that you will continue your son is just adorable i loved the pictures i saw on the website everybody has to go check out the website, www.specialheartfamily.com. There are even pictures of Paul signing the books with you. Mm -hmm. (laughs) That was just just so precious. And he signed Paul, and then he drew a heart. (laughs) And if you were really special, he drew a heart with a scar on it. (laughs) Oh, that's so neat. (laughs) Well, he's become quite the advocate, hasn't he? He really has. He owns it. He owns it. Well, thank you so much for coming on Heart to Heart with Anna. It's just been such a delight to talk to you, and I really enjoyed meeting you at the book signing in Grapevine earlier oh, yeah. this summer because I was able to introduce my son Alex to you. That's and right. That made th- that made our day because we felt such a connection with you, and and I think all of us heart families feel that connection. We've all been in those waiting rooms. We've all dealt with the uncertainty of what that open heart surgery is going to entail and what our futures entail, but I think we all experience also the hope that we get from these children, and you've been a big part of that for so many families. So thank you so much for coming well, on the show you. today. Thank you for having me on, and thanks for all you do. Well, thanks. And I also want to take one moment to thank Katie Ricalde, your assistant, and Sarah Beatty, who is your publicist, for sending me all of the information and for helping to make this interview possible. And that concludes this episode of Heart to Heart with Anna. Thank you for listening today. Please come back next week on Tuesday at noon for a brand new episode. But February is Heart Month, and Heart to Heart with Anna is going to be featuring a radio show every single day during the month of February 2016. So please find it, like us on Facebook. Check out our website, hearttoheartwithanna.com, and that's where you'll see the schedule for all the shows that we'll be having in the month of February. Check out our Cafe Press Boutique. Follow our radio show on Blog Talk Radio and especially on Spreaker because if you can help us get enough followers on Spreaker that we can petition iHeartRadio to carry our show and then people can listen to the show in their cars. So thanks again for listening. We know that congenital heart defects touch people all over the globe. But remember, my friends, you are not alone. Thank you again for joining us this week. We hope you've been inspired and empowered to become an advocate for the congenital heart defect community. Heart to Heart with Anna, with your host, Anna Jaworski, can be heard every Tuesday at 12 noon Eastern Time. We'll talk again next week.